All right, so with that done, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up Ian Kress, who's the new, uh, as you heard earlier, director of sports. We always like to have the director of sports on uh, Channel 6 introduce our, our sports speakers today. I did want to say this about Jake. I've known Jake a lot of years. As a matter of fact, uh, I know his dad very well. And uh, Jake was at Eastern and uh, a few places uh, in between. And, and I got to tell you, you got to be empathetic with this. When you're recruiting to a northern climb, you are in a very difficult neighborhood. I mean, when you look at Omaha and see who the finalists are every year in a College World Series, there's nobody north of uh, North Carolina and uh, not many people east of Mississippi without, <coughs> except the Floridas and the LSUs. So it is a very difficult job. So I'm going to leave the rest of this up to Ian Kress. Please, uh, please welcome to the podium the new director of sports at Channel 6. Thank you, Chris. Chris did want me to introduce myself a little bit more, obviously. The new sports director over at Channel 6. I'm originally from Brighton, graduated from Michigan State, and while I was there, I interned at Channel 6, oddly enough, and then uh, kind of worked my way up, got a job down in Ohio, came back in December of 2020, and less than three years later, here we are making the show. But uh, during my time at Michigan State, um, one of the assignments I had actually was to interview a baseball player. And it was my first time ever covering a sport at Michigan State. So Jake was oddly enough the first coach I ever interviewed. And I was very nervous. And when I showed up to practice, I probably asked some very stupid questions. But he was always great with the answers. He gave very detailed, descriptive answers. Always appreciated that about him. And over the years, the relationship has just continued to grow. And it's been one I've enjoyed. And so Jake, he is about to enter his 16th season as the head coach at Michigan State. This past year, he won his 400th career game as the Spartans leader. He also had three guys drafted by the major, in the Major League Baseball draft. And Mitch Jeff won the second round was their shortstop, yeah, shortstop, and was the highest drafted Spartan since 1998. So on that note, bring up Jake Moss. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ian, and uh, congratulations on the job. I do remember that interview, by the way. Um, I think I was involved maybe in one of your senior projects, too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but no, really, they're really happy for you, man, and uh, he's going to do great things. I, uh, as um, Julie said earlier, I'm an Alma College alum, a proud Alma College alum. Um, I know nothing about business, uh, and I will start there. Uh, the accounting class at Alma College was, uh, was the reason I was not a business major. I would like to say, though, I'm, I'm smart enough to realize that I, when I found English, I figured that all I had to do was make a point and defend it. It didn't have to be right, as long as I defended it. And here we are, I'm an English major, and uh, uh, made it through four years of college at, at Alma College, uh, barely. But uh, I've had, a, uh, I've had a, a very, very blessed career um, up to this point. It's been unbelievable because really guys like me don't get jobs like this. Um, there are just the, I mean, there are, we have 300 schools plus in Division One baseball. I think there are two or three of us that play at the Division Three level. Um, and one of them is at Vanderbilt. I think the other guy's at North Carolina. And so uh, it's just really difficult to break in at this level when you've played at a lower level. And so I graduated, well, I'm a local guy. Um, so this was my dream job. You know, even as a kid, I, I saw Kirk Gibson play at Coves Field. And, I remember watching Carl Banks and Magic Johnson and all of those guys when I was a kid. Um, but this was the goal of, of mine when I started uh, my whole experience in uh, college baseball. However, um, I got a teaching degree out of, out of college uh, and uh, I taught English and social studies at the high school level for a year and a half. Um, the first semester I taught, I was filling in at, at Lakeview High School up by Big Rapids. Uh, and loved the school, loved the district. Had a great experience there, but I was a permanent sub for a, for a lady taking maternity leave. She came back. They didn't have a job. They offered me an eighth grade job, and I said, there is no way I'm teaching middle school kids. Um, <laughs> thank you, but no, uh, which was the right move. Uh, and then, so I interviewed all summer, got a job at Weberville, so I was able to move back closer to home. Uh, worked at Weberville, 
and walked right into the varsity baseball job um, at Weberville High School, which was awesome. I coached seventh grade basketball, which was a complete disaster. Um, but the baseball job was great. Uh, but toward the end of the year, I just thought, I can't see myself doing this for the next 30 years of my life. I was, I was looking at the clock all day long, waiting for that bell to ring for, so that I could go out to practice. So that summer, I interviewed all over the place. Um, I sent a million resumes out, uh, and you know, nothing, we didn't have the internet yet. So uh, you know, it was all newspapers and you know, looking for ads in, in college coaching. I found an ad in the NCAA News for a job as an assistant coach in, in, at Iowa Central Community College in Fort Dodge, Iowa. And uh, never, I had no idea where Fort Dodge, Iowa was, never been to Iowa. Um, I talked to this guy on the phone, and they were rebuilding the program the year before. They had lost, uh, they basically dropped the program midway through the year because they had 10 players on the team. Two of them became ineligible, which left them with eight players, and you have to have nine to play a game. Uh, so they wiped the program out, hired this guy. Um, and uh, he said, we're putting together this team, we're going to win the national championship. <coughs> I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, he said, and I asked him, you know, well, what's, you know, tell me a little bit about it. I was dying to get into college baseball, just looking for a foot in the door. And, um, you know, he said, well, he said, you can live in our dorms. He said, you can eat in the cafeteria, and we'll pay you $2,000, $2,500 a, a year to do it. And I said, um, all right, I'm in. And I left the job. I was making more money than I knew what to do with uh, when I was teaching at Weberville High School, just fresh out of college, 23, 24 years old. And I left all that, loaded up my Ford Probe at the time, moved out to, to Iowa to live in the dorm to make two grand a year um, to work uh, at Iowa Central Community College. And it was actually the best move that I could have made because there is, I don't know if anybody's ever been to Fort Dodge, Iowa. Has anybody ever been? You've been to Fort Dodge, Iowa? You have too? God bless you. You made it out too. There was uh, nothing for me to do in Fort Dodge, Iowa, which was exactly what I needed. I needed to really immerse myself into that job because once I, you know, driving out there is ten and a half hours, and it's a lot of time to think about, am I doing it? What's that? A lot of corn, a lot of cows, yep. Uh, a lot of time to think in that car on the way out there, and I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, then I need to really, you know, commit myself to it. And I had zero distractions out there. It was all the job. I was the first guy in the office in the morning. I was the last guy to leave. And um, my, uh, the, the guy that I worked for was almost right. In the first year, we ended up, we turned the program around, had a great year, got to the College World Series. Uh, the next year, we finished runner-up to Grand Rapids Community College, lost to the national championship game. So we were really close. But that's kind of, that, you know, I learned a lot of things along the way in my career. I learned how to work. I learned how to be ready to take advantage of, of an opportunity. I learned how to, how to dream big um, because this job at Michigan State was my dream job once I committed to college coaching. Um, and then I learned how to be patient and how to listen. Uh, and, and all of those things along the way, I learned from every place that, that I have been. Um, I, left, uh, I left Iowa Central um, and got a job as a graduate assistant at Eastern Michigan University. I was at Iowa Central for two years. Um, met my wife in between those two years, worked a bunch of camps, met my wife. She lived in Indianapolis, long story, you don't want to hear it. Um, but I, I ended up getting a job as a grad assistant at Eastern Michigan University um, and got my graduate degree at Eastern Michigan, uh, was there and ended up hooking on as the full-time assistant there uh, after a year and spent seven years at Eastern Michigan. But we had 35 guys on our team. It was the head coach, who Chris knew very well, uh, Roger Corio, um, and myself. And that was it. And if you look at the, if you watch Michigan State basketball play, you know, they'll get a bench. There's coaches, though, is parading up and down the sidelines, and then all his assistant coaches, and then all the guys that sit behind the bench. I mean, there's like, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, it seems like. Uh, coaches to players. We at Eastern Michigan had a head coach and then there was me. And our head coach was a pitching coach, which means he's completely with the pitchers. That's it. Which means I get everybody else. So I'm running around like crazy during practice, coaching the catchers, the infielders, the outfielders, doing the hitting, taking care of the field. Um, I had to basically kind of do it all. I instituted a fundraising thing uh, because we had no money at Eastern Michigan. I was a recruiting coordinator. 
uh, and I didn't know any different um, because this was my opportunity because this was the foot in the door at Division One Baseball. And again, guys like me don't get these chances. So I poured myself into it again. Thank God my wife was the breadwinner um, and she was understanding because I, I could not have done it uh, without her. We had two young kids at the time, we have three now. Uh, but uh, without her support, um, there's no way that this would have this, this would have worked. Um, so I was kind of doing everything at Eastern Michigan. Was there for, again, seven years. Um, then I had an opportunity. I didn't think my boss was going to go anywhere. He was a lifer at Eastern Michigan. He graduated from there in the early 70s. He'd been the head coach for 10 years. And I didn't see that changing at all. So I thought, if I really want to get to Michigan State at some point, i got to make a move. Um, and a job opened up at the University of Michigan as an assistant. And I ended up getting that job, and I almost got kicked out of my family, um, because you know my parents told me, don't bring any of that blue and yellow stuff home for Christmas or whatever, which is, of course, all I did. Um, but I just told my dad, I said, look, this is, this is one thing, this is a move that I have to make for my career. And um, it turned out to be the, the right move. I worked for a great guy. Uh, who's now the head coach at Ball State University. We had a really good team. We had a lot of success down there. Um, I had to listen to that god-awful fight song a lot. Um, I put on a brave face, I will tell you that, because I've been a Spartan fan my whole life. So um, I was more focused on our team and our kids than, uh, than kind of everything else. But, um, but there, my job was a recruiting coordinator, and I just coached the catchers, which was a lot different for me, because I've been used to doing everything at Eastern Michigan. Uh, however, uh, it prepared me for you know what was next because at the recruiting coordinator job at the University of Michigan, much like at Michigan State, much like in Indiana or Nebraska, uh, it's a pretty big job, and uh, you know that's the lifeblood of the program. If you don't have good players, you're not going to be any good. I don't care if, if you know Joe Torre is coaching your team or you know whoever. If you don't have good coach or good players, you're not going to win anything. And so that was a big job for me. I just focused on the recruiting. Um, I, I was able to, to focus on one position, uh, and so I got to work with some other guys, uh, uh, you know, coaching the game with my position group at the forefront, though, um, and, and that was that was a huge because because there was a lot more riding on it. We had a lot of success there. Um, we were uh, you know, we were basically nine outs away from the College World Series my last year there, uh, and then. Um, after that season, the job at Eastern Michigan opened up, the head coaching job at Eastern Michigan opened up. It was right around this time of year. So I think about, um, you know, uh, Coach Smith at Michigan State just got hired the other day. Uh, he's got spring football practice to look forward to. He's going to put his roster together, he's going to have spring football practice, and then in the fall they're going to go compete. I got hired at Eastern Michigan right around this time, and I missed fall baseball. Because fall baseball for us is kind of like spring practice. So I get hired at Eastern Michigan, a brand new head coach, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I've got, you know, because you don't know until you're in the seat. And so there's no way to know until, you know, you're, you get into that seat. And as an assistant, you're the good guy. You know, the assistant's the kind of the conduit between the, the, the players and the head coach. Right? When you're the head coach, now you're making the decisions, and there's a wall that immediately goes up. Uh, right or wrong, it's just kind of how it is. And so, you know, there was navigating that with players and trying to continue to develop player relationships. But most importantly, at the time, I didn't know what we had as far as talent on that team because I wasn't able to, I recruited the seniors from when I was there in the past, but I didn't really know any of these guys. And we kind of went into that 2008 season uh, really blind. Uh, we didn't know what we had. And we went out to play our first series at New Mexico State, and we got swept. We lost all four games, uh, which you know we kind of understood. We, we figured that would that would happen. They were pretty good. Then we went to Florida and lost two at University of Florida. Then we went to Florida Atlantic and lost four. Then we went to Tennessee and lost three. Then we went to Kentucky and lost two. We were 0 and 17. My first year as a head coach. I was so excited to be the head coach. And I'll never forget, we're 0-17, and I'm walking down the hallway to get the mail, um, and our track coach was there, he was looking at something in his hand, and he looked up and saw me and stopped, did an about face, and went quickly in the other direction because he didn't want any of that bad mojo rubbing off. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is really bad. Um, 
We ended up winning our first game down at uh, Wright State, which was a good win for us. Um, we came up here to Michigan State, and uh, we beat Michigan State pretty good, which was a thrill for me. Um, and then Mac play started, and um, I talked about how to be ready to take advantage of an opportunity. We had a, we had a young man on, my, on our team named Mike Sasha, and, and Mike was Mike was an incredible athlete, but was very injury prone. I mean, he was built like a Greek god. He could run. He could throw. Um, Mike had, had a stress fracture in his back, we found out, in January. So Mike was out for a while. His very first practice back in March, he was the first, he was so excited, he was the first guy who jumped into this drill. It was a bunting drill. So he squared around the bunt, put the bat out there, the ball hit the bat, and that hit him in the face. Just kind of a dumb luck type of thing, which, you know, shattered his orbital bone, so he was out for a couple more weeks. Um, Mike was finally able to play our first conference series against Miami of Ohio. It's Friday night, it's freezing cold. Uh, we're playing Miami of Ohio at our place, and uh, the game goes along, we go into extra innings, it's a good game back and forth, you know, it's one of those games, where, you know, we were two and 17 at the time, like we were actually gonna win this game, which was a, you know, a, a thrill in and of itself. Um, but we get into extra innings, and I had used the, my pitch hit for my DH, so the pitcher had to be put into the game to hit, and the pitcher was supposed to lead off the next inning. It was like the 12th inning. I couldn't have a pitcher lead off, but Mike was our last guy on the bench. I'm like, Mike, I need you to hit. You just got cleared yesterday. I need you to go in and pitch hit. It's like, okay, here we go. So he's all excited. He jumps into the batter's box. First pitch of the inning is a curveball. I'll never forget a curveball that bounced about four feet in front of home plate. Mike swung at it and missed. <laughs> and now I feel terrible because as a coach, my job is to put these guys in a position to be successful. And Mike hadn't swung a bat for months because of all of his injuries, and I'm asking him to do something that he's not ready for. And I'm really kind of embarrassed for Mike, to be quite honest with you. Embarrassed for myself and our team. The second pitch was another curveball, bounced on top of home plate this one, so it was a little bit closer. Mike swung and missed again, but now the count's 0 2. For whatever reason, this guy who's pitching, um, decided to get away from throwing curveballs, which, you know, I, for the life of me to this day, I don't understand, but he threw him a fastball for a ball. He threw a couple others that weren't real close. And now it's a full count uh, with nobody out. Mike's leading off the inning. I'm thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe this guy will throw him a ball. Maybe you'll hit him. If he hits him, that's great. And then he'll go down to first base. And, you know, I mean, you're trying to think of anything that could be positive. So he threw a strike, and Mike wound up and hit it. I'm like, oh my God, he hit the ball. I can't believe he hit it. He actually hit it. And I'm watching the ball, and he hit it on a trajectory that is like a 45 degree angle off the bat. He hit it hard. I'm like, holy smokes. I mean, this ball is going. I turn around, I look at the left fielder. Left fielder's running back to the fence. I'm like, this is, you know, it could be off the fence or, you know, something for a double. And the ball ends up clearing the fence for a home run. We win the game. Oh my God. Third win of the year. It was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had with a player. Just because he had been through so much, he was such a good kid, and to see him have that kind of success um, was something that, you know, again, I'll never forget. Pretty emotional at the time. I still get a little choked up every once in a while because I'm thinking of, you know, just what that, what that poor kid had been through and was able to have that moment for our team. That moment kind of catapulted our team. And believe it or not, we went from 0-17 to winning the Mid-American Conference West Division the number one seed for the conference tournament. We rolled through the conference tournament and played the NCAA regional for the first time, well, for the second time since like 1980 or something like that. So, but had that moment not happened, I don't think we would have would've, would've won a championship. Uh, Mike was ready to take advantage of that opportunity. I didn't think he was. Uh, it took him a couple pitches to get ready, I think. Yeah. But he was ready for that opportunity uh, and he took advantage of it, uh, which was really cool. Um, the third thing again, you know, I learned about how to dream big. Um, again, driving out to Iowa, Michigan State was my dream job. And I thought, if I'm going to do this, this is where I want to end up. Um, the job had opened up a couple times. It opened up the first time when I was in Iowa. I was 24 years old. I knew I didn't have any chance of getting the job. I didn't apply um, because that would have been a waste of time. The job opened up again when I was an assistant at the University of Michigan. And I didn't apply at that time either because I knew that there was no way they were going to hire a guy from the University of Michigan to work at Michigan State. And right or wrong, that's the truth. And, uh, you know, I, I just, it wasn't, the, the timing wasn't right for me. Um, and I wasn't re ready for that either. 
Uh, and so I passed up on that job and they hired a, a, a guy actually that was younger than me at the time and I thought, well, that's it. You know, I missed, I missed the opportunity and it's, it's probably never going to happen. Um, so, you know, I went through my, my job in Michigan, just kind of kept my nose down and, and tried to do my job. Um, and being patient and learning how to listen was the fourth thing that, that really I, I think I had learned and, and that became really important at that time because I had to be patient for the right job. Um, for, for me, and, and uh, you know, I had to make I had to I had to make a lot of decisions and listen to a lot of different people um, along the way, so that I could make that right decision when, if and when that opportunity came. At Michigan, I had an op I had a chance to sit down with Bo Schembechler um, just one time, um, and it was about I think it was about a month or two before he passed away. Um, he was over in the football building. Um, and I had talked to our sports information guy and I just asked him if, if Bo was ever around. He said, yeah, you want to meet him? And I said, well, sure. Um, I hated Bo Schembechler when I was a kid. I mean, I thought this guy was like the devil incarnate, right? I mean, you're a Michigan State fan. This is the head coach of Michigan. You know, we, I don't like that guy at all. But I thought, well, I mean, how many opportunities are, am I going to have to sit down with a guy like Bo Schembechler? So I sat, we sat down. I walked into his office, he kicked Jerry Hanlon out, who was his like offensive coordinator, I think, or his assistant, you know, forever. And Jerry, get out of here, I can talk to this guy. So he's got a big cigar, big fat cigar that he's chewing on. Um, and I bet I sat there, he took about an hour with me. And I'm just the assistant baseball coach, I'm nobody. And he's, that guy spent about an hour with me. We were just talking sports, talking jobs, all of that. Um, and toward the end of it, he said, what's your, you know, what's your goal? What do you, what, what do you want to do with, with this whole, you know, coaching thing? And I told him, I had my whole plan laid out. You know, like I said, well, coach, and he said, you know, by the time I was 30, I wanted to be an assistant in the MAC. By the time I was 35, I wanted to be, you know, an assistant in the Big Ten. By the time I'm 40, I want to be a head coach somewhere. By the time I'm 45, I want to be a head coach in the Big Ten. And, you know, I didn't mention Michigan State. Um, but he stopped me. He said, and I was very quick to point out that I had accomplished all these goals ahead of schedule. Like I'm, I'm on it right now. Like I, this is where I, things are going great. I'm in the right place. And he shut me up. He said, "Stop." He said, "I don't want to hear anymore." He says, "The only thing you need to worry about is doing as good a job as you can where you're at." And I'm telling you, the rest of it's going to take care of itself. And I had the foresight. I'm not the smartest guy, <laughs> but I had the foresight to listen to that, and that really hit home for me because we won. The, the regional at Vanderbilt that year, um, our pitching coach, who's a great guy, uh, you know, everybody's hugging on the field and, you know, it's a you know, big dog pile and all that stuff. And I, we're walking off the field with our pitching coach and he says, well, where do you think our next jobs are going to be? And he was more focused on the next job. And that I think that was the difference, I think. And I was more focused on just doing as good a job I had as, as I could do where I was because that's what Bo told me. And uh, it ended up working out. Um, so being patient, learning how to listen um, has been huge for, for me uh, in my life and you know, with, our, with my job, with our, with our players. Um, I feel like uh, you know, we've learned a lot along the way. The, the landscape of college baseball, college athletics has changed uh, a ton in the last five years even. Um, but there are some things that we do with our program um, that we've built our program on uh, that we want our guys to kind of embody every day. Discipline, passion, and detail are the three things that our, that our players see every single day uh, in, before practice, it's in the locker room, before games we talk about it. Uh, we can play a disciplined brand of baseball. If we can play with some passion and enthusiasm, let's be honest, baseball is not a fast moving game. It can be pretty boring. Uh, and so you have to create some type of energy if you're gonna play at a high level. Uh, so if we can create that passion and then if we can take care of detail, um, I think we have a chance to be very su successful. I stole that from a, a young business professionals luncheon that I was at uh, my first year at Michigan State, uh, and that like it was it like clicked for me at that point. So that's what we're going to build our program around. Um, we tell our guys we want them to impress somebody every day. Somebody's going to see you for the very first time uh, at some point today. So whether that be some little kid who's come out to, to watch us play, kind of like what I was when I was a kid, I thought those guys were Superman. You know, and it's the same thing when a little five-year-old kid comes out. Uh, and so, you know, how, what kind of an impression are you going to leave on that, on that kid? Um, but it also could be uh, somebody's parent, somebody's grandparent. It could be uh, president of a company that's just kind of killing time because where our field sits, it's in the middle of campus. 
So that could be somebody that's out there, you know, your job's to impress that guy. It could be an alum, um, it could be a scout uh, or a scouting director of a big league team. You don't know who you're gonna, who's going to see you for the very first time. So our job is to leave a lasting positive impression on that guy. Um, and then the last thing really just has been more recent uh, in my career at Michigan State, but uh, you know, the idea of having a, more of a, a relationship with our players that's not transactional, but more of a true relationship with our guys, um, and giving those guys ownership uh, in what's happening. Uh, leaders on our team a lot uh, as far as um, you know, ideas moving forward, kind of the direction they want their team to go. Coach Izzo says it all the time, and it's so true. Uh, a player coach team is going to be better than a team that's coached by his coach, and that's absolutely correct. And so we've really tried to give our players more ownership of, of what we're doing. I always tell them I do have veto rights <laughs> uh, because I am the head coach, and ultimately I'm the one that answers for, for every aspect of our program. Um, but I want them to be involved. And I think when they're involved, they take more of a stake in it. They have a lot more pride, passion for it. Uh, and then I think, you know, at that point, we, uh, you know, we, uh, we're, we're more successful. So we've, we've won a lot of games. We've lost a lot of games. Uh, but I do think that our guys are ready for whatever's next. And that's what we we'll tell them when we recruit them. Um, you know, our, my job is to help you be ready for whatever is next in your life, whether that be professional baseball or not, whether that be, you know, a job in the business, um, in the business world, uh, or a, a teacher, or even a husband and a father, um, you know, hopefully it's pro ball, but, uh, you know, we have to prepare those guys for whatever is next, and, and I think our guys do a really, really good job of, of that. So that's uh, that's what we do at Michigan State. So why are we at this we'll question? Q&A if yeah, anybody for has sure. Any questions questions at all? Mind. Sure. Actually, I'll, I'll start off with the Q&A and uh, name image likeness. Uh, most people think football, but it's got to impact baseball as well. Name image likeness, yes, any level. Um, but, uh, you know, for I, the way, I think there are plenty of unintended consequences of name image likeness. I think it was initially the idea was to give our guys an opportunity to maybe run a camp over Thanksgiving or Christmas break and earn some money that way or sell some t-shirts that you know, with your name on it, make some money that way, and it's turned into something that I feel like is out of control. And uh, I don't know how it's going to stop. So it'll be interesting to see. But we are involved a little bit. Um, as a coach, I'm, I can't be involved, um, So, which is another challenging piece because, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're going to play by the rules and do things the right way, um, you know, but you still have to dip your foot into that that pot. So uh, there is plenty of there. There are a lot more challenges with name image like this than we thought there were going to be for sure. Coach, thanks so much for all that you do in the community. You, you really are a blessing. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question with regard to uh, your dad. Um, he is truly a local legend, and uh, the community has been blessed to have him as well. And I'm just curious about his influence on your career. Uh, and some of your philosophies. Yeah, thanks, Vic. I, uh, I appreciate that. My dad, I invited him out here today. I saw him on my way to the car. He teaches a baseball class at Michigan State, actually. And uh, he just turned 80. Um, and he coached at Lansing Everett forever, and then coached at Lansing Catholic. He's in the Michigan High School Hall of Fame. Very proud of my dad. I had a chance to play for him. I had a chance to coach both at Eastern Michigan. He was our volunteer assistant. And then he was actually my volunteer assistant here for four years. Uh, at Michigan State, um, I had a chance to coach against him. I played at Weber, or I was coaching at Weberville High School. My dad was coaching at Lansing Everett, and uh, we went over and played those guys. Probably the most nervous I've ever been before any game in my career, and that's the honest to God truth. Um, but yeah, my dad was, uh, you know, I, I, if I could be, you know, really half the coach that my dad is, I, I would have a lot of, you know, a lot of success. I think he. Uh, you can't go more than 10 feet. I love bringing them to basketball games. I love bringing them to football games on campus. It used to drive my kids crazy because you can't walk more than 10 feet before somebody stops. You. Say, hey, coach, how are you? Or, uh, and I get that a lot now, too. I'll get stopped. Um, and they don't really want to say hello to me. They're asking how my dad's doing. And, you know, I had your dad, in, 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 uh, I had your dad for gym class at West Junior High School in 1968 type of thing. And I get that a lot, and I love it. Um, he's a uh, yeah, he's a, he's a Hall of Famer in every sense of the word for sure. And um, you know, I've, I've tried to develop a lot of 
uh, what I do based on what he did. You know, uh, he worked his tail off at that baseball program. He was a, he was a high school gym teacher, um, and he, he did nothing but, you know, once he figured out how to get a student teacher involved, <laughs> he kind of became a full-time baseball coach and just kind of turned his teaching responsibilities over to his uh, student teacher. Um, but, uh, you know, he worked on that field constantly. He was always doing something to try to develop his players. Um, the relationships that he had with his players, fundraising, I mean, you name it, um, you know, he did it. And so, yeah, I learned an awful lot from my dad, for sure. Very thankful for him. Thanks for the kind words again. Hi, Jake. I have a question. Oh. Uh, it's not about Elma. Okay, I don't want story, so it's good. good. Um, I'm curious about something that Chris alluded to earlier about recruiting and in a northern school, in a Big Ten school, how does your recruiting process work and how do, how do you measure that success based on geography sometimes? Yeah, we, we like to think about recruiting in our office as kind of taking an inside-out approach, right? We try to stay close to home first, branch out to the Midwest if, as we need to, and then we can go nationally, we feel like, um, if we have to. Our first baseman last year was from uh, uh, Pasadena, California. Uh, really hadn't seen much snow since uh, until he came out here. And, uh, you know, he had a pretty good career for us and ended up signing for almost a million dollars. Uh, and so, you know, I think you have to have guys that are used to playing in the cold, uh, even a day like today. You know, I would, we brought out uh, Oregon a number of years ago. We brought out Fresno State a number of years ago. And I was praying that it would be as cold as it could be because we do have a temperature limit that we play. Our, just as an aside, our, if, if the real feel, according to AccuWeather, this is the truth, the real feel, according to AccuWeather, is 28 degrees a half an hour before the game, we play. If it's 27, we don't. But if it's 28 or above, we're playing. So we play in a lot of cold weather. And I think you have to have guys that are used to playing in the cold weather, number one. Um, we have, we've had teams here in the past that it was very evident that they, they didn't want to play in the cold weather. And we try to sell our guys on the fact that we're just going to be tougher than them. And uh, we've had a lot of success with that playing at home. Um, but more than, more, even more than playing in the cold weather, is getting ready to start your season in, inside. Um, because that's a lot different, you know. You can't enter squad like a lot of other schools do. When we, when we go south to play our first game, sometimes the first day that we see a fly ball is the day of the first game, which, you know, it gives me a lot of gray hair, I can tell you that. But it's, that's kind of what it is. So um, I feel like we have guys that, uh, that, that I wouldn't say they like to play in the cold weather, but they accept it, they understand it, and that's because we recruit the majority of our guys from the, from the Midwest, so, yeah. Your response to Julie's question made me think of what are some of the advantages and disadvantages that are going to come to the new West Coast programs coming into the Big Ten, specifically how that's going to impact what you do in the baseball team? Yeah, well, it certainly continues to make our league better and better baseball-wise. So those are four really, really good programs in USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon. Um, so the talent level is just continues to get better and better, um, which I'm not that excited about, to be quite honest with you. Uh, you know, uh, again, I think that that can open up some doors recruiting-wise. Um, you know, possibility, again, in Southern California, but we've had some success down there. Uh, again, I think you have to be ready to play in the cold. Um, I think the travel and how we set up our schedule is going to be a lot different um, because we play 56 games in 14 weeks, uh, which is an average of four games per week. However, you know, we don't start, our first game is February 16th this year. So we go on the road for three, come back. The next weekend we go on the road for three and come back. So our schedule gets really compact when we play here, uh, once we start opening up at home in order to get all of our games in. And so there are a lot of weeks where we have to play. We'll play Friday, Saturday, Sunday in conference games. Monday's an off day. And then a lot of weeks we'll play Tuesday, Wednesday, with Thursday being the practice or travel day. And then, you know, you play against so you're playing five games in a week. But if we go out to UCLA, you know, and we end up flying back, because we don't fly, we fly commercially. Uh, we fly back on that Sunday night, it's probably a red eye, uh, which means we get back to campus about 8 o'clock Monday morning. Now guys have to go to class. Um, I'm probably not going to want to play that Tuesday, and so it impacts how we schedule, how many games we're going to, you know, try to play. If we're going to try to play them all, it's going to impact what we do with our schedule early. Um, so there's a lot of, and not to mention the cost. 
you know, I have to pay attention to how expensive it is to go out to LA, um, you know, or to fly west, which could change kind of what we do early, um, where and where we play or where we fly to early. So the talent, you know, is one thing, but there's a lot of other factors, at least for a guy like me, that, that we have to pay attention to. But I told the guy that makes the schedule, I said, if the first conference series is March 15th, then I want to play USC yes. here on March 15th. Please. <laughs> He said, get in line, that's what everybody has to do. So, yeah. yeah, another thing that he didn't bring up is there are a lot of baseball teams, and now in the Big Ten, who will be practicing outdoors right now. We don't have that advantage when we're inside. Um, it's interesting. One of the great themes that uh, that we see when we have when we have tremendous coaches here to speak. And by the way, Bo Schembechler did speak in this series. Uh, I was fortunate to to know Bo, and it was about three weeks before he got. So we were one of his last speeches. But he had he had it down to a science. I mean, he knew what was going on. And you do that too, which is really good. Um, Jake, did you happen to take my Okay. <clears throat> I don't ever know what to do without a script. Uh, okay, so with that, again, I want to thank um, all of our sponsors, and you see them on your program. Uh, we, we can't do this without them. Fly Lansing, uh, Chain Chevrolet Cadillac, Dean Transportation, Sinair, LAFQ, Lansing Sports Commission, WLNS Channel 6, PNC, and Foster Swift. Thank you all for that. I want to thank my team too, Sarah Mosier, uh, Ben Robinson, and uh, as well as uh, Michelle O'Kelly, Jeff Mosier, and uh, where's Caitlin? Is Caitlin still here? Okay, their daughter was shadowing today. Caitlin, come up here and give a little wave. She is uh, shadowing today and uh, from the Wilson Talent Center. So it's great to have you here too, right? So remember, this leads to a job. <laughs> okay, with that in mind, when is our next event? Which I don't see here. Do you remember? It's the last page. You say last you say page. It. And it's not. Okay. All right, good. All right, so our next event uh, will be uh, the 2024 Economic Forecast Breakfast, where we'll introduce the Michigan's uh, Future Business Index, but also we'll hear from Julie Pinkston about what's coming in the next uh, 12 months for, uh, for the area as far as, uh, you know, the, the uh, well, now, choose Lansing, right? Um, and, and a number of other people from this area, so you get a real good economic uh, feel for it. Um, the newest future business index uh, is out in the field right now. I encourage all of you here, uh, use, use that in your program to answer the questions uh, today, if you possibly can. Uh, so with that, um, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate everyone's involvement. Ian, thanks for coming out and uh, introducing uh, Jake Boss. Jake, thanks so much for uh, spending time here. And Eric Grosskrantz is a former pitching star at MSU. Thank you for coming and uh, making sure everything Jake says is, is right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Have a prosperous month. And, uh,